Sai Ram, dear listeners, and welcome once again to Radio Sai Study Circle. This is the seventh study circle, and we are really grateful to you for the number of positive feedback we have received about this program time and again. But today we have something really interesting for you, and I will now ask Mr. Rangarajan, the moderator of this discussion, to take over and reveal today's theme for you. As usual, apart from me, there are three other brothers from the university participating in this discussion: Amay Desh Pandey, Sai Giridhar, and Ganesh. So, sir, please unveil today's topic for us. We love you, Swami. So familiar. <laughs> yes, we so all have heard that have so many times. To we have Swami. said it to Bhagwan so many times. We love you, Swami. But today, what we would like to discuss is what exactly do we mean by loving Bhagwan? Is it loving just the physical form? is it following his message is it living his message because many times this debate comes and i say you see i am doing whatever swami wants me to do i get up in the morning i chant his name i do puja i do my worship in the evening also i sing bhajans and that's it so i love bhagwan now but is this what we mean by loving bhagwan or is it something more than this because many times we find this dichotomy of people saying i am doing what he is saying what more is expected of me or is it that we have literally got to live his message throughout our life this is what i think we should be discussing today what do we mean by we love you swami so i'm reminded of one very beautiful experience that happened in the trai vrindavan mm-hmm. what we call the trai sessions and bhagwan was sitting on the jhula and uh, as usual bhagwan starts in his inimitable style so boys do you love me and there was a thunderous response to bhagwan yeah. saying yes swami we love you but bhagwan's response was very different he nodded in disapproval he said no my boys don't love me my boys only like me oh so everybody wanted to now know what is the difference between loving and liking bhagwan and then bhagwan went on to explain this in a very beautiful way he said you have a dog at home a pet dog at home and all along you know you pet the dog and you caress it and you give it a bath and you want to play with it and you feed it etc but do you really follow the dog in every moment of its life mm-hmm. wherever the dog run do you run behind it no so can you say that you like the dog or you love the dog and then swami went on to say this something which probably hurt a lot of us swami said my boys also like me like that only my just God. like they do like their dog they want to be with me they want to be around me they want to see me happy they want to feed me etc etc but they don't want to follow what i say and then swami said to love swami is to, is follow. to follow swami hmm. and so i think if we can rephrase today's topic as loving swami versus liking swami that's beautiful i think it's a profound difference between the two words giridhar what do you feel about it sir i think it's a profound thing which ame has just mentioned because swami often used to tell us students that when you are in swami's presence you follow all the discipline that swami expects you hmm. to follow but moment you go back home you start watching tv going to the movies and you know what not somehow this has been a trend in many of the youngsters probably even i was a victim to this particular trend some time back that we tend to conditionally or conveniently follow swami's teachings right. as per our choice like swami has categorically mentioned like television is television you know it's actually poison but what happens is when we are here in prashanti nilayam I would not get to watch TV I would be very happy about it I would live a wonderful life but as soon as I go back home I don't know why I would watch TV 24 hours literally and I think that is something which differentiates liking from loving and loving as Amay beautifully said is constantly every moment of your life following each and everything which Bhagwan says Actually so Bhagwan said it not me 
right <laughs> yeah. so it's basically what you're saying it's not just about rituals but it's yes. living the spirit, spirit of the spirit of the ritual yeah. bishu is that what yeah, what's exactly. your yeah exactly as uh, gidda was mentioning this i can just think of few instances of such nature which possibly we all have seen in our lives mm-hmm. wherein you will see people who are very regular for bhajans who are very regular for naga sankirtan you admire them for their commitment to make time and attend these sessions but somehow you feel that their devotion to swami doesn't extend beyond that you would want to see a very different personality much more say a loving or uh, a personality that swami talks about an ideal devotee but everybody they have their own vasanas like we all have their own vasanas but somehow we see that the devotion to swami limits to that to that particular activity it doesn't really translate into the other things that we do in our normal life so it's like a compartmentalized life right you divide your life into two parts i now love swami and then now you know another I'm another very life. striking thing that comes to my mind is this is to happen when swami used to physically give darshan you know there are times when boys would keep a mat or a devotee would keep a mat and uh, just to go for drinking water or something and when you come back suppose your mat is moved even an inch <laughs> you look bold. at the other person as if he's a criminal but when swami comes to darshan you flash your brightest smile Unfortunately most of us are oblivious of the fact we are not even aware I used to always feel that you know But that's love for Swami that, yeah huh. and that person is absolutely sure it's my love for Swami mm-hmm. I want to sit in the first line but it doesn't bother him that you know I just heard that other person be looking at him in such that's a right. harsh you, manner In fact Bishu you will also find people who say we love Swami and we are ready to sacrifice our personal time family time professional time money and what not in the name of commitment to Bhagwan's mission but they must also remember that they have to balance their roles in life there are certain commitments that an individual may have towards his or her family and profession which should not be compromised in the name of swami's work in fact swami has often told mm. that all work is his work correct but yes at times situations may definitely arise where one has to really go out of the way to meet the need of the hour and in those times he or she should have already developed such an understanding with the concerned individuals in their lives that they are not hurt or felt neglected in fact on one occasion one boy was sharing with one of our senior faculty members of university that how his mother was a bal vikas guru and was so immersed in organizational activities that she had no time for her own son she was not even giving the minimum attention that a child deserves from his mother that is why in swami's work if we have not learned to balance our role and if we have compartmentalized that this work is swami's work and that work is not swami's work then we have totally missed the point all work is his work yeah yeah i think the understanding that's emerging now is basically that liking god is something very limited it is selfish more out of self interest very narrow minded but loving god is something where you love him for his sake you follow his message it is very selfless and unlimited but i think we need to delve on this a little more in trying to understand how we start with trying to love god but then you know you get overpowered with many other things and unconsciously you actually forget that you're not loving god but you're actually harming him can we have actual anecdotes and some sort of experiences which could elaborate this we should can actually, we start with you yes sir i am reminded of a story from the life of buddha mm-hmm. ananda was the cousin of buddha and uh, when buddha attained enlightenment ananda decided to spend all his time with the buddha but before taking initiation he wanted to make sure that he is not treated at par with all the other disciples he wanted to retain his status as the elder cousin brother of buddha so what he did he went to buddha and said being my younger brother it is your duty buddha to obey me after initiation you will become my master and you know i'll become your disciple and i will not be able to ask you anything or command from anything so now let me ask you some things before i get initiated <laughs> so buddha says fine as you please go ahead ananda what do you want so ananda had three wishes first i should always be with you you shall never talk to anyone in secret <laughs> and you shall never send me away this was first wish this copyright over god <laughs> <laughs> yes the second if i want you to meet anyone at any time of the day or night you shall not refuse to do so 
Oh, oh my. No. <laughs> <laughs> that is Ananda's second wish. So basically he wanted Buddha to stay in a cage. <laughs> <laughs> and the third wish. You and I shall sleep in the same room. I should always be with you. And he says, Buddha, don't forget these wishes of mine. Now I'm ready. So what do you call this love? <laughs> I don't think this is even <laughs> liking Buddha. <laughs> okay, let's listen to the complete story. Yeah. So Buddha says, fine, I'm ready. So please get initiated. So Ananda gets uh, initiated and he becomes uh, almost uh, virtually the shadow of Buddha. Mm-hmm. He was always by Buddha's side. And many years later, it was time for Lord Buddha to depart. And uh, he said, by dusk tomorrow, I shall be gone. call all the monks i want to address one last time to all of you so all the monks gather and there were about a thousand enlightened monks all of them were standing around buddha and they were calm and composed no one was crying no one was in grief except ananda ananda was in deep anguish he was crying he was inconsolable they didn't know what to do with him Buddha out of mercy looked at Ananda and he smiled. He asked him, "Ananda, why do you cry? I have done everything that you wanted me to do. All your wishes I have fulfilled in this entire time that you have been with me." And when Buddha said this, Ananda cried even more. He said, "Buddha, now I don't know what I will do with my life. I breathe the same air that you breathe. I did everything that you did." but i have not attained enlightenment and now i feel my life is hopeless i don't know how to live without you then buddha says what can i do ananda i did everything that you wanted me to do i always knew that if i fulfill these wishes it will be a barrier for your spiritual progress but you are not willing to forget that i was your younger brother you wanted to retain all these privileges your surrender was conditional then buddha says perhaps my death shall make it unconditional oh my god and then buddha left his mortal coil all the enlightened monks they congregated in close proximity and you know it was a moment of deep introspection they tried to collect buddha's teachings and they were ruminating over all this but ananda was not in that gathering ananda had become a complete wreck emotionally he spent that entire night only crying he was helpless he was alone and then he realized that though he had seen everything he had seen nothing mm. he realized that he had drunk from the fountain of nectar but he had not tasted the nectar he really found himself to be very alone for the first time he felt such a void in his life and on that night in that deep silence his self introspection began and he cried that entire night and in that night of introspection soon some realization dawned you know towards the morning there was some deep peace that engulfed him and he started with time realizing himself so if you take this tale what happened to ananda mm. all his life when buddha was there ananda was liking buddha he started loving buddha only when buddha left his mortal coil if only he was loving buddha when buddha was there imagine what a wealth <laughs> of spiritual development that he would have gained for himself very very thoughtful Ganesh, you would like to add yes, to this? Yes, as we saw that, Ananda totally missed the point. Hmm. In fact, most of us, when we get into a ritualistic way of life, we forget the spirit behind what we are doing. Yeah. Key thing is, we have to know where our mind is. Means where the mind is, is where we are actually. Yes. This reminds me of a story of a Brahmin who was living right in front of a prostitute's house. One day, it so happened that again, Gautam Buddha was supposed to visit the village where they were staying. The Brahmin was very confident that that buddha will bless his house first an extremely ritualistic and pious brahmin that he thought he was mm. but to his utter dismay buddha blessed the prostitute first even before he came to brahmin's place mm-hmm. the brahmin's ego got hurt he was furious and on whom gautam buddha mm-hmm. so when buddha came to his house instead of greeting buddha with all the pleasantries he demanded an answer as to why he had to visit the prostitute's home at all and that to before his home buddha simply smiled and in the most compassionate tone he said the prostitute is what she is because of some inevitable circumstances of her life mm-hmm. but in spite of your noble lineage and birth 
you are always curious and interested on who is coming and going from prostitute's house what a tragedy your mind is not on god but whereas she probably may have more devotion than you so we see we are what and where our mind dwells indeed ganesh what you are reiterating again is that we need to live by the spirit of the word of the master and that is really important in fact i am reminded of a story it seems there are a couple of monks who uh during the period of dawn they were walking by a river and the river was in a state of deluge and they wanted to cross over to go to the place where they were heading to and suddenly they saw that there was a young woman there standing on the bank on the side that they were on and she was calling out for help she requested the monks to help her cross the river so what one of the monks immediately did was he carried the woman in his arms crossed the river put her on the other bank and they continued with the journey towards the destination it was almost dusk and the other monk all through this journey was looking very troubled so this monk was wondering why is he kind of suffering internally so he asked him what's wrong with you so that monk replied what you did in the morning was not right so he said what did i do he said no how you being a celibate could touch a young lady and put her across the river this monk then smiled and said my dear brother she was a person in need and that's all i knew i didn't see it any differently i had dropped her 12 hours back across the bank it seems to me that you are still carrying her 12 hours hence <laughs> yeah. isn't it so it's really about living by the spirit of the master's words which is much more important than taking the words by themselves and as ganesh said where the mind is that's where we really are talking of stories i am reminded of a very humorous story which bhagwan narrates this is about a spiritual gathering and i believe there was a master who was narrating the story of lord rama and every day as he would keep narrating for hours together slowly devotees would come and then move away but there was one lady who would stay there right till the end of the talk so the master was so thrilled that at least there is one devotee who is so touched by his narration this happened for a few days and then towards the end of the week he observed that every day she would be the last woman sitting there so on the final day he told her mother i am really so happy forget the other devotees at least there was one woman who was touched by really my narration interested. and that's why you are sitting here till the end then she looked at him in a very puzzled way she said the master what are you saying and he said no you know you're the only person waiting till the end of this narration she said no 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 the mat on which you're sitting actually belongs to me i'm just waiting so that after you go i can pick up my mat and go away <laughs> you know it's so funny in fact there's a very similar story bhagwan narrates and i think that we should listen to directly from bhagwan it's a similar story about another spiritual congregation and yet another pandit and a woman so let's listen to bhagwan narrating this in his own voice ఒక పండితుడు రామాయణం చక్కగా సుసర్వ అతిమధురంగా అను మనోహరంగా గానం చేస్తూ రామాయణం వర్ణిస్తూ ఎ స్కాలర్ సింగింగ్ విత్ హిస్ మెలోడియస్ వాయిస్ ఇన్ ఎ మోస్ట్ ఎంచాంటింగ్ క్యాప్టివేటింగ్ బ్యూటిఫుల్ స్టైల్ హి స్టార్టెడ్ నరేటింగ్ ది స్క్రిప్చర్ రామాయణం అది చాలా పురాతనమైన గ్రంథం కనుక యాజ్ ఇట్ ఇస్ ఎన్ ఎన్షియన్ టెక్స్ట్ ఆయన అనేక కళ్యాణి రామాయణం పారాయణం చేసి యాజ్ హి రెడ్ రిపీటెడ్లీ ప్రజలకంతా కొన్ని చాలా ప్రబోధం చేస్తూ రావడం చేత యాజ్ వాస్ టీచింగ్ రామాయణ టు పీపుల్ కొత్త రామాయణాన్ని కొనుక్కోవడానికి ఇక్కడ చిక్కలేదు హి కుడ్ నాట్ బై న్యూ రామాయణ టెక్స్ట్ ఈ పాప రామాయణకి కుట్టి పాప చాలా దానం తో కుట్టి దానికి కొనుక్కోవడం హి స్టిచ్ సేమ్ ఓల్డ్ టెక్స్ట్ అండ్ వాస్ మేకింగ్ యూస్ ఆఫ్ ఇట్ ఒక భక్తురాలు A devotee, a woman, used to sit in the front always. She sits up even before the scholar arrives. So long Ramayana discourse was going on, she wipes off her eyes. So long Ramayana discourse was going on, she wipes off her eyes. She goes on nodding her head and wipes out the tears. Ee Ramayana. 
the reading of the text came to conclusion aanadu ee panditulu motta motta punaruti ikka teethaki kandaki padaraki nature the scholar got up to distribute the sacred water on this concluding day purna oka dilu oka moste oka dilu oka rakunda pochu kaani ee utraalu maatra okka naale kodam tappare one might come one day and they may not be able to come the following day but this old lady never missed any talk ee ekka satta honta kora poorthi attend chestu istri she is the only one who attended this satta రామాయణ <laughs> <laughs> He said, "Sir, I don't know all about this Ramayana." Ramayana, what is it? Who Parana? What is it? Who TV series? I don't know what Ramayana is. I don't know what Parana is. Reading it. Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? The scholar asked, "What is the journalism to over this week?" He said, "I don't listen to anything." But in the last month, last month. Then why are you shedding the tears of joy? Na bhakta manichya. My husband died. అతను మరణించిన పూర్వం వారిని సాంప్రదాయాన్ని he said that's really humorous but uh, believe me is this not what happens most of the time with absolutely. us absolutely yeah. and bhagwan has such a beautiful way of narrating the story <laughs> it Probably goes straight to your heart the message is in fact the video is very interesting if you see swami the way swami is laughing right. when you are narrating think, this i think this is a very very powerful message that bhagwan is sending through is that all along even when we sit uh, you know opposite to bhagwan we are so lost in his beauty and we are so lost in the way he is you know that we are not actually imbibing the message that he is giving to us i am in fact reminded of yet another very interesting anecdote that bhagwan used to narrate he used to say that there was a gentleman who you know gave up everything in life and went to the himalayas and started a very rigorous penance mm-hmm. so that uh, penance included you know 16 17 hours of meditation sitting on a particular place in a particular rock and continuously doing it and almost several months later one day when he came to take his usual position he saw somebody else sitting on that rock mm-hmm. and he was absolutely shocked mm-hmm. you know he went up to this person and said you know i think you are sitting on the wrong rock this is my rock <laughs> i have been sitting here for days together in fact months together and doing my penance so that person looked at him and said there are so many other rocks over here you can go and sit anywhere you want and do it mm-hmm. and this person lost his cool this yogi <laughs> the so called detached person yeah the det- a person who gave up his family belonging <laughs> city life etc went all the way to himalayas and caught hold of a rock <laughs> and got attached to the rock sounds like the concept of patent has come from there <laughs> <laughs> i guess in a sense that is the irony that we all face when we are following we lose ourselves into the trees and we lose sight of the entire forest yeah very true guess i think what we are trying to understand is now becoming very clear that in the name of love possibly we are actually looking for something which has a selfish motive and we are more interested in our own Ourselves. happiness and joy rather than as swami always says if you love somebody we must actually make that person happy rather yeah. than looking for our own happiness oh, yes. in fact i remember a beautiful anecdote wherein once a devotee who was traveling with bhagwan in the car this happened recently when bhagwan's physical frame was not keeping very well and so this devotee thought it was a very good opportunity and he prayed to bhagwan swami please cure yourself and swami instantly said why i am fine and we know this is what we have always heard swami saying swami said i am perfectly fine the devotee said no swami we cannot see you like this please cure yourself 
then Swami said, but I am happy. And then this devotee said, no Swami, but we are not happy because we don't feel happy looking at you like this. Then Bhagwan smiled and said, oh, so for your happiness, you want me to cure myself. You know, and then the message came so loud and clear that we are really not concerned about Bhagwan's happiness. But in the name of love, we are more concerned about, am I happy? We are still, what's in it for me? Yeah, it's still coming to what's in it for me. So then where is the love? So I think now it's becoming very clear that when you say, I love Bhagwan, it really means following his teachings because that is what makes him Him happy. happy. So now let's discuss about, fine, when you say following Bhagwan's teachings or loving Bhagwan is following his teachings, what do we mean by that? What do we mean by following his teachings? Fine, I'm attending bhajans, I'm doing worship. Is that not following his teachings? Can we sort of discuss on that? Amai, why don't you start? Sir, I'm reminded of another beautiful incident that happened. It was those years, I think in 98, 99, when every year Paduka Puja used to happen. And you know, this typically Paduka Puja is where you have the silver feet of Bhagwan, and every couple does puja for it. And after one of such pujas, Swami had called a few research scholars inside for an interview. And Swami was just discussing about all the things that happened. And uh, Swami asks, so what is really Paduka Puja? And, uh, you know, one of the senior research scholars, he explained to Swami about all the things, you know, trying to explain to Bhagwan what really happened out there, (laughs) explaining the various rituals. And then Swami went on to say, no, 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 that is not Paduka Puja. Real Paduka Puja is following the steps of the Master. Walking in the steps of the Master is the real Paduka Puja, which I want you all to do. So, in fact, I think loving Swami is about following his footsteps. Steps. In fact, I may, uh, we have heard Swami saying this. He says, Aushadam and Patyam. What really it means is, Aushadam is medicine and Patyam is the diet. When a patient goes to a doctor, it's always these two things which the doctor prescribes to make the patient healthy. One is he needs to take medicine and invariably along with the medicine goes a controlled diet. Yes. So, Bhagwan says, medicine is like loving Swami, but the diet is following his teachings. And he says, so if you, the patient who is suffering from this worldly disease or the ailment of the samsara has to get healthy, he needs to ail, love Bhagwan and be also follow his teaching. That is Aushadam plus Patyam. Very true. Very nice. In fact, sir, in Ramayana, there is a clear instance of where Lord Rama himself defines what this love truly means Mm -hmm. for God. We all know the episode where Lord Sri Rama has gone on exile to the forest. And uh, Bharata comes running in order to plead him to come back and take back the kingdom and rule the kingdom of Ayodhya. Bharata says that the king who had actually asked you to go away, my dear brother, is no longer there. Why don't you come and take back the kingdom? Lord Sri Rama had a great lesson that he wanted to impart at that moment. But he did that through King Janaka. During this whole argument which went on between Rama and Bharata, King Janaka played the role of a judge. So, when the verdict was to be spelt out, King Janaka said, When there is a conflict between Dharma and Prema, where Bharata represents love and Rama represents Dharma or right conduct, righteousness, it is always love that wins over Dharma or Prema wins over Dharma. Listening to this, all the Ayodhya Vasis erupted in joy, thinking that yes, this is the verdict and Lord Sri Rama is going to come back because Bharata has won his argument. Yes. But as usual, in his own inimitable way, Rama gives a smile to Janaka and Janaka says, But Prema too has its own dharma. Even love has its own dharma. But what is the dharma of love? He says, The dharma of love is that you need to ask your beloved, your Lord, in what lies his happiness and implicitly follow those words of the Lord and not impose on him what brings joy and happiness to yourself. Hearing this, we all know Bharata immediately submitted himself to Rama, having realized what true love means and he accepted to rule the kingdom of Ayodhya on behalf of Lord Rama because in that light, the joy and happiness of Lord Rama. This communicates the message very clearly. Is it not Ganesh? Really, sir. In fact, the subtle and right understanding of 
such concepts mm-hmm. is very important even before we take the first step in the spirituality and talking of the first step it is said that the essence of all the knowledge and right understanding of scriptural text is practice until and unless we have made a sincere and systematic attempt to put into practice what we have learned we will be like people who enjoy the food in recipe books and not on <laughs> <Yes>. the plate <laughs> a classic example that comes to my mind is an instance from swami rama's life when he was giving some spiritual lessons to a small group of very ardent followers who were sincerely taking notes and i'm sure some of you may be taking notes even now as the study circle is going on the point that i want to make comes now a very unassuming man came and sat with this group of sincere students he seemed to have a carefree attitude and was definitely not taking any notes as can be expected from any teacher swami rama accosted this man for not being serious about the lessons to which the man replied bluntly what you are teaching is sheerly bookish knowledge it must be practical knowledge born out of conviction springing out of direct practice and experience swami rama was obviously taken aback and he demanded him to show his so called practical knowledge just then the man saw an ant trying to scramble past him he took the ant in his hand broke the body of the ant into three parts kept them separately at a reasonable distance closed his both the eyes and within few moments the three parts of the body joined back to each other and the ant came back to life immediately scrambling away now needless to say all were stunned by this feat and swami rama asked this man with all the reverence as to where he had learned this art pat came the reply from your guru mm-hmm. till then swami rama had thought that he was his guru's favorite disciple but how is it that his guru had taught a stranger a feat of literally mastering death mm. he got furious and went running straight to his guru demanding an explanation for keeping such an art secret from him <laughs> the guru calmly replied he practices whatever i have taught him if you practice then all the good things will be bestowed upon you at this juncture i must immediately clarify that the purpose of narrating swami rama's episode in our current discussion is not to glorify the power of occultism or siddhis that a seeker may acquire during certain spiritual practices which in fact can be a source of distraction on the ultimate goal of self realization the point i want to drive here through this episode is one ounce of practice is worth more than tons and tons of bookish knowledge absolutely in fact ganesh there's a beautiful narration by a great spiritual master called nisargadatta maharaj in his book called i am that in fact the book is a compilation of various conversation that devotees had with him and i would like to quote verbatim from the book itself exactly what precisely we are talking about that is putting into practice sincerely teachings the teachings and the words of the master, master. what reward it can give you the questioner asks nisargadatta maharaj how does one come to know of the truth as you have done and i now quote what nisargadatta maharaj had to say i can only tell you what i know from my own experience when i met my guru he told me you are not what you take yourself to be find out what you are watch the sense i am find your real self i obeyed him because i trusted him i did as he told me all my spare time i would spend looking at myself in silence and what a difference it made and how soon it took me only 3 years to realize my true nature my guru died soon after i met him but it made no difference i remembered what he told me and persevered the fruit of it is here with me unquote it's beautiful wonderful giridhar that is really profound i am reminded of uh, another great personality from whom we can learn how to practice the teachings of the guru mm-hmm. it is king janaka in a forest near mithila say suka had come and he was teaching atma tattva to disciples when king janaka came to know of that he went to king suka and he prayed that he be accepted as one of the disciples and say suka he readily agreed and every day at a particular time the session used to start 
and Janaka used to come from the kingdom. He was a king, so he used to attend to his duties, but be on time for the session. One day, the Seishuka came early for the class, and the other disciples were there. Janaka had not yet come, and the sage was waiting for Janaka to arrive to start the class. And this was not something which was liked by all the disciples. They felt, how could Sage Sukha do this? He is such an enlightened sage. How could he be partial to King Janaka just because he is a king? He, is a king. he has wealth. He has power. What about us? Finally, of course, after a few minutes, Janaka came and Sage Sukha started the class. And Sukha knew what was going on in the minds of these disciples. And soon, what he did through his mystic powers, he created a situation where all the disciples saw that the whole city of Mithila was in fire. So the moment they saw this, all the disciples, they just ran helter shelter from the class because they wanted to protect their belongings, their mm. house, their mm. clothes, whatever. Only person who did not move was King Janaka. He was just motionless. In fact, Sai Sukha told Janaka that your palace is on fire. That didn't bother him. And soon all the disciples returned and they reported that everything is fine in the city, nothing is burning. Then Sai Sukha explained how each one of them ran to protect a small house of theirs while King Janaka, who had a palace, was totally unaffected. And then he went on to explain how Janaka's love for the Guru was the maximum because his attention on his teachings was the maximum. And that's how he also had the maximum of Guru's love. In fact, I'm reminded of one of our brothers who used to push Bhagwan's chair. He was on duty a few years back. It so happened that he had an opportunity to ask Swami Swami, amongst the various relationships that Swami talks about in his discourses, which is the best relationship that we can have with you? And apparently at that moment, Swami did not answer. But later, as he was taking Bhagwan's chair out, Swami just turned back and said, the best relationship that you can have with me is Guru Shishyas, that is a master and a disciple. And then Swami went on to say, the reason for it being that in every other kind of relationship that we can have, there is some amount of selfishness or there is some amount of conditionality. Whereas between that of a master and a disciple, there is absolutely no condition is attached. The master simply loves the disciple out of the feeling that his disciple should progress. And the disciple in turn loves the master because he has to follow the master. Wonderful. I think now it's clear that when we say, Bhagwan, we love you, it means we must follow his teachings. But as we have seen in the example of either Swami Rama or King Janaka, or what you talk, Giridhar, about uh, Nisargadat Maharaj. In all these cases, the important thing is that practice of these teachings led to their individual transformation. So I think now we must move to the next level wherein we say, yes, Bhagwan, we will follow your teachings, but not just in letter, but in spirit so that it brings about a change in us. Because otherwise, just saying, following your teaching, following your teaching, again would become like, I love you, Swami, I love you, Swami. In fact, I remember on one occasion when uh, Sri Indulal Shah, who was heading the Global Satyasai Seva organization, when he made a trip overseas, he had asked Bhagwan, Bhagwan, can you give me some message which I can communicate to all the devotees over there? It was a Satyasai service meet. And Bhagwan gave a beautiful statement. He said, tell them what service they do is not as important as what that service does to them. Wow. In the sense, is the service changing me? Is it transforming me? Am I becoming less short-tempered? Am I becoming more compassionate? If all this is not happening, Bhagwan says, what's the use of the service you're doing? So can we now move on to the next level wherein we say, how can these teachings lead to personal transformation? Bishu, can you give some examples of devotees where following Bhagwan's teachings has actually led to a personal transformation? Sir, I would like to share something which is not an example of a devotee who had this transformation, okay. but how Swami emphasized this to a very okay. dear devotee. Mm -hmm. It is an interaction that uh, Mrs. Rani Subramanyam, whom lovingly everyone calls Rani Ma, had with Swami some time ago. She is one who had a very deep spiritual quest and Swami also gave her a lot of opportunities to her as well as to their family and guiding them on the spiritual path. And it was a time when they were getting a lot of chances, interviews and interactions. And one day her daughter asked Swami, Swami, you have been so good to our family. Now, how do we keep this grace? Are we going to get these chances continuously? She wanted to ensure that, you know, this never stops. Then Swami says, you are getting all these chances 
not because you are coming to puttaparthi or you are having my darshan the only way you can ensure that you get complete grace paripurna krupa is only when you hold on to my teachings and then swami says i am not important what is important is my teachings my and he says if you can get inspiration from coming to puttaparthi then you come but if you come to puttaparthi and you are disturbed if you are not able to progress then you need not come to puttaparthi but what is important is you follow my teachings coming to puttaparthi is not all that important this is coming from bhagwan himself it's so amazing amai uh, what about you do you have any such anecdote sir i am in fact reminded of one occasion when in 2005 when we were in kodaikanal and swami was asking us to go for bhajans in the evening so typically after the tea session in the afternoon we would have a session with bhagwan at the end of it he would say you know all of you go for bhajans and in that session as he was asking us to go for bhajans so he asked so everybody likes bhajans so we all said yes swami so then swami kind of you know made uh, a joke saying that so much devotion no so much devotion you all have <laughs> and as swami got up he said i don't want your devotion i want transformation and the way i understood it it was like a devotion can come on a thursday or on a sunday evening i mean <laughs> or when we go to kulvanthal every day from 6 to how you go to the church on a sunday morning <laughs> exactly you know we step into kulvanthal mm. we are at a high in devotion we shed a tear or two for god and the moment we step out we are back to our old selves mm. no in fact swami said devotion vastundi potundi devotion can come and go but transformation once it comes it stays with you so in fact the gift of devotion should be transformation fantastic so on the same lines i remember one of the senior brothers sharing mm-hmm. that once he was going along with swami had an opportunity to walk with swami and that time one of the devotees shouted i love you swami and instantly swami replied don't love me love my teaching <laughs> <laughs> in fact swami always used to emphasize on transformation and that is something which was very dear to him and uh, i remember a beautiful episode which happened in the year 1999 a group of mba students were seated in the front rows in mandir and as swami came for darshan they all shouted out to swami saying swami interview swami please swami interview swami <laughs> and uh, swami you know loves to crack jokes with boys so he said get your wives i'll give you interview <laughs> so everybody laughed out loud but they thought swami was just joking so they continued to say swami we love you swami please give us interview swami and all that then swami just turned and he was very serious at that point of time he said hey your mind is your wife your atma or your soul is the husband if your mind and the husband that is if the mind and the atma are in perfect state of understanding there is peace and harmony at home but if the mind and atma have diverse opinions or they think differently the result swami said he puns with the word he says the result would be diverse and that will lead <laughs> to a catastrophe divorce divorce, divorce. <laughs> you know so swami insisted when i say get your wife i'll give you interview what i mean is i am your soul let your mind ever be on me then you will automatically have that inner view, inner view. which is the most important beautiful. step to transformation beautiful In fact talking of devotion transmuting into transformation Swami has told that the river of devotion should flow between the banks of duty and discipline even devotion should be regulated in the discipline channel and this calls for training the mind into applying breaks In the modern times we all have become inflicted with an addiction of speed yes we want everything to move fast what we can also call instant gratification that is why when the young generation who are always bubbling with energy enthusiasm and passion when they reminded be careful be more self controlled they get restless self control is synonymous to applying break it may seem to be contradicting the freedom the intense speed with which one wants to achieve his ambitions but it is this self control that stops the individual to take the shortcuts which are more often than not the wrong cuts of the life i am sure brother sai girdar will agree with me out of his immense experience in bike stunts and four wheeler stunts that the better the break of the bike is more confident you will feel as a driver not just that ganesh you need to know what is the right time to apply them exactly yes so we must train our mind to apply the brakes when and where required 
to avoid the accidents. You have to strike a balance between the accelerator and the brake. This is the spirit behind the word self-control which ultimately leads to transformation. Then our devotion can really transmute into transformation. I think it's now getting obvious that what is most dear to God is you follow his teachings and that teaching has to lead to transformation. I'm reminded of a very nice anecdote this happened during a student days. Bhagwan would put us through these ups and downs which mm. you know the students are typically aware of. And it was one of those periods when Bhagwan was very unhappy with the students and we waited for days and Swami was never talking to us. So then came a point a breakdown point we said Bhagwan we have to now you know plead with you mercy. So we all sort of got together as a team and when Bhagwan came out for darshan we rushed to him held on to him and we said Swami please forgive us please forgive us. But Bhagwan was very strict this was our devotion but he reminded us discipline he said all are watching don't do this. So then you know slowly that please forgive us became please Swami please Swami that's how and nobody would understand what it is it would just end up with please Swami please Swami and then how beautifully it was our devotion he reminded us of discipline and next he reminded us of a duty so beautifully swami punned on it he said what are you saying please swami please swami he said you please swami then automatically i will talk to you <laughs> so, so beautiful you know you please swami and you please swami how do we please swami by following, following his teachings teaching. yeah. so in such a wonderful way bhagwan would communicate this i mean why we remember this is it makes such a deep impact on our minds one sentence from bhagwan but it says it all I think we should not conclude this discussion without mentioning one more point. Typically people feel the moment you say follow Bhagwan's teachings they say oh come on now I love Swami that's enough. And because generally the feeling is when you have to follow his teachings it's very tough. We remember the great saints and sages who had to walk the bed of thorns and they cried all the time they were pining. So somehow there's a feeling that it's a very tough path. But you know I love Swami is a very easy path. I think we should remove this myth. I am reminded of Mother Teresa's episode where we know she was known for catering to and serving the aged people and the lepers who were almost on their deathbed. This was one of those times when she was treating a person who had fallen into a drain and there were a lot of maggots on his body. Mm. It was stinking and here a person came her biographer who saw this and he said mother how could you be doing this it's so stinking i wouldn't do this for a billion dollars mm. and immediately she replied she said i'm also not doing it for a billion dollars i'm doing it for god i'm doing it for jesus mm. in the sense her experience was very pleasant but the onlookers experience was oh how could you be doing this so many a time i think we should not make judgment saying it is very tough it is very difficult because ask the person is it really tough yes i mean let's discuss a little bit about this before we wind up the discussion in fact uh, on one occasion yes bhagwan was asked by one earnest devotee as to why some of his dearest devotees like meera bai and sakku yeah. bai mm-hmm. they had to go through so much of suffering and travail and it appears that the spiritual path is full of strain and tribulations pat came swami's reply mm-hmm. did sakku bai or meera bai come and oh. tell you that they were suffering <laughs> did, he, did he say that wow that's amazing <laughs> that is your perception okay. and truly it is a real misconception that the spiritual path is full of trials and tribulation but if you go and actually ask the devotee who is going through the test he or she will be absolutely oblivious of all the suffering because his focus is on the god on the beloved i think pandavas also never complained you know it's only we who feel oh pandavas went through so much of suffering yes. yeah that's why the saying goes beauty lies in the eye of beholder but the actual experience is known only to the person who is going through that situation of life mm-hmm. hence we must not be judgmental about others behavior because it may be our figment of imagination so true in fact as i was listening to rangarajan sir and ganesh i think we all can relate to this in one manner you know when i decided to stay back in prashanti nilayam a lot of my classmates and friends they always felt oh my god you have done such a big sacrifice <laughs> okay but frankly it is i have never felt like that in fact i used to feel the opposite i feel they are sacrificing so much of joy and happiness that i get staying in prashanti nilayam because here you get to do god's work and also you enjoy all the good things of life and if you want anything anytime swami provides it so the concept that you know following swami's teachings means your life will become a very strict and disciplined life completely boring with no fun no color i think these are all our figments of imagination absolutely it's very joyful experience it's actually a joyful experience because things happen so beautifully in your life though it may have ups and downs there is no doubt about it but it's a very joyful experience and in fact as ganesh was mentioning about saints i'm reminded of the story of father damien 
Father Damien, if you know, he was sent to the Hawaiian settlement in Molokai. It was a small island where lepers were quarantined off to. And uh, the Bishop of Hawaiian Kingdom wanted to send a priest to that settlement. And Father Damien volunteered to go there. And he was sent there for a few months with instructions that he should not go too close to the deceased. But Father Damien, given what he was, he mingled with them because he wanted to serve them. He wanted to build houses for them, a school, he nursed them and etc, etc. And so what happened was he ended up sick. But one prayer that he always did to Jesus is this. Lord, you gave your life for all mankind. How can I call myself a follower of Christ if I am not willing to give myself away in service? That was Father Damien. And yes, he succumbed to that disease. But he had no regrets. He had a great life. He enjoyed every moment of being there for the other person. In fact, sir, I think we have discussed many instances of what has been the experience of somebody who has experimented to love God, if I may say so. But I think the fundamental issue is, as we started off with, you know, many people ask this question, oh, it's a very difficult thing to do. How do I go about following God's words and all that? We had a wonderful experience when some of us had made a trip to Rishikesh, Vashishta Gufa, the cave of Sage Vashishta where Swami himself had visited in the year 1961. We met a Swamiji there by name Swami Shantananda and he was speaking to us and he was talking to us about sadhana, about practicing the teachings which Bhagwan has taught us. And uh, one of us suddenly said, but Swamiji, it's so difficult to put it into practice. And he immediately pounced on us saying, see, this is the fundamental problem. You put a barrier right in front of you yourself. Mental block. A mental block before anybody else, any other barrier comes in front of you, you know, due to life situations and all that. The first fundamental barrier is something which we put in front of our own selves. And he said, unless you remove this barrier, how will you ever experience the sweetness or joy of following God's words? He said, try for a week, for a month, for a year. And you will experience the joy of it. And that experience is what will take you ahead. So it's a step-by-step process. We need to have the perseverance to try or experiment loving God in this way. Yes, I think this step-by-step process is something that is so convenient in our spiritual growth. Most of us think that it's a quantum leap. That is, today I am like this. From tomorrow, I am expected to be like that. Overnight Mm -hmm. miracle. Overnight miracle. I can't do this. Yes, and that's what gives us this mental block that, oh God, this is going to be so difficult. In fact, I'm reminded of a beautiful prayer that I had read somewhere, which goes something like this. Oh Lord, forgive me for I am not what I ought to be. But thank you, Lord, for I am not what I used to be. Oh, wonderful. That is every day I am taking that one little step. Swami, I am not what I used to be. But I know, Swami, I am not yet what I ought to be. That takes care that we are not complacent. Yes, so I think it's a step-by-step process that just like Shabri, who took the pains of going through that whole process day in, day out, eventually one day the Lord came. Like that, our spiritual progress can be a day-to-day process. Yeah, I guess all of us have been through this. So, Ame, why don't you share one of your personal experiences to really illustrate how this happens? In fact, for me, following Bhagwan's teachings has been an extremely, I should say, a joyous experience. It started off with a lot of pain. You know, so I used to think that, oh God, when Swami says, love all, serve all, it's like the most difficult thing to do because how can you love all and how can you therefore serve all? So I took it up as a challenge that Swami, all in your lifetime, you always radiated love. Probably, you know, anybody who came to Bhagwan, his smile was so bewitching, okay, that it mesmerized all of us and we would forget all our problems. Swami, can I also lead a life like that? So this is one message of Bhagwan that I tried to implement in my own life. And I found it is so beautiful. The other day, I would like to just narrate this experience. Yeah, sure. I was traveling in the train and we have all sorts of people coming, you know, begging for a lot of things. And it kind of many times turns us off because there are so many people coming and probably some of them don't even deserve that. So there was this person who came up to me and, you know, started pestering me to give something to him. And I did not want to because I did not have, very frankly, I did not have enough in my pockets to give him. And there was this burning anger that was now beginning to come inside me. And that's when I suddenly thought that, okay, this is a time when I can start practicing Bhagwan's teachings. That is, yeah. radiate my love towards that person who is asking me. Because I don't know the circumstance. 
and so all of a sudden what i did was i looked at this person and gave him a beautiful smile okay and i told him that no i am not going to give you <laughs> fully knowing in my heart at that mm-hmm. moment that swami may your love pour forth from me to this person and it was a miracle of sorts because even that person looked at me he smiled at me and he just walked away and i have had several such experiences when it has come to you know radiating love classic example is of phyllis crystal transforming the hijackers yeah. we will not go into that but yeah. i think that is a really classic example of that in fact sir i have a very very trivial experience but nevertheless which had an impact on my life physically i was suffering from a disease called migraine which is a one sided headache for more than a decade and i tried all kinds of medications for the first 4 5 years nothing seemed to help me so i even prayed to bhagwan once saying swami there is this kind of a headache which keeps coming swami what should i do and swami said cheptano cheptano i'll tell you i'll tell you and uh, years passed by and swami had taken us to chennai where he had advised us that coffee and tea are very bad for health <laughs> so he said you have to stop coffee and tea hey that's tough <laughs> <laughs> in fact this is precisely what the thought which is going through our minds and it was even more tougher for me because every time i had a headache it was natural for me to run for a cup of coffee or tea and now swami is asking me to stop coffee and tea of course he never forces anything on us he was advising that it is good for us if we do so and believe me or not brothers i stopped coffee and tea because swami said so and after that i never had a single episode of migraine until today it's 5 years since then wow. amazing i mean i cannot correlate stopping coffee or tea with migraine, with but migraine that, was the, that was a cure for but it. nevertheless i never took any medication but this is how it happened i stopped mm-hmm. coffee and tea and my migraine stopped too <laughs> so probably practicing swami's teachings or his words has much more profound effect on us than we can even comprehend i want to add to what ami was saying about radiating love you know this is what i have also experienced in my life whenever i do not have a cordial relationship with someone and i feel you know it cannot be solved with just a frank chat i need to do something more then what i do is when i sit down for prayers the next morning i envelop this person with my love mm-hmm. and i do it really sincerely and wholeheartedly and i'll tell you this has worked it may not work you do it once but you do it for 2 3 days 4 5 days continuously how, how does it work what happens suddenly you will see that there is a warmth in the relationship mm-hmm. earlier when you meet that person and there is so much of negative energy but slowly that transforms a positive energy and then you start talking you know things become normal in fact i vouch what vishu is saying because i had a similar experience there was one brother of mine we stayed in the same room but somehow i had kind of developed an aversion to him because of difference of opinion basically but then there was this very strong feeling in me that you know swami says love all i cannot afford to hate anybody in this world so i with all my heart i prayed to swami swami show me some way that i'll start loving even him you know through one of his discourses swami had given this methodology of doing it he says if you cannot come face to face with a person whom you don't like when you are away from them sit and pray for them from the bottom of your heart pray for them that they be very happy in their life pray for them that they follow swami's teachings and they grow very near and dear to bhagwan such selfless prayer i have found by practical experience that today when both of us meet we look into each other's eyes we are very very comfortable with each other and we exchange pleasantries and there's a perfectly harmonious and loving relationship between the two of us and it is merely the miracle of prayer that has done this that's lovely beautiful experiences so basically this whole process of following his teachings becomes very enjoyable when you do it with the right spirit and in a way every moment becomes a miracle as bishu you said you know your whole relationship changes because of this uh, particular experience in we fact we start beginning to notice all the small small miracles that begin really? to happen in our lives then it's no more uh, Life you know becomes it's, a it's no more manifestation of vibhuti or manifestation of nectar which are miracles in their own way but what becomes more important are the subtle miracles the timing the circumstance somebody just coming to you telling you a word which changes your life in fact i would just like to quote one very beautiful anecdote this is about a student who studied from the primary school and he says when he was in the primary school he is now in the institute the one day he lost his socks 
maybe it was a sports day and he left his shoes outside lost his socks he was feeling so bad about it and then he went and told his teacher madam i've lost my socks and you know he thought he'll get a very nice pat and she'll feel sorry for him but she in fact scolded him and chided him can't you even take care of your socks so this put him off so much that in the evening when he went to the mandir he had a very you know dull look on his face he felt very bad and then he says you know something unimaginable happened bhagwan came out of the interview room and out came a huge basket and he came straight to the primary school students and he was going to distribute something to them guess what socks there is socks, socks. now wow. he said come on this cannot be a coincidence even the young lad blew in shock <laughs> and all of them you know the madam distributed socks to all of them he was extremely happy but this was not the master stroke mm-hmm. the master stroke was bhagwan then picked up a few socks asking every student did you get did you get he came close to this boy and without asking him he threw one more pair of socks at the boy wow <laughs> and this student says this one event of bhagwan's only presence and only sense changed his life completely forever he never needed any further proof of you know god's presence in a life which makes our entire journey a miracle every minute and every second it's not about one day or a particular event life becomes so meaningful with that very meaningful and enjoyable too enjoyable. so basically what we have done today is we have started with the whole theme of loving bhagwan and as we have understood when you say we love swami it's not about liking as amai said but it's about truly loving and true loving means following his teachings again following his teachings should not be just limited to following his teachings on paper but it should lead to individual transformation and ultimately this whole process is not a very difficult stressful you know but it's a very enjoyable process which makes every second of a life memorable and enjoyable i guess with this let it is all hope and pray that we truly love bhagwan the way yes. he wants he us wants to, us to and please him please him please, please, please him. yes I think that was wonderful. Let us end the session with a prayer like we do in every study circle. Om Samastha Loka Sukhino Bhavantu Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, Shanti.